Our scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 18, and I am reading from our New American Standard. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I believe to you as of first importance was what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were to be one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I lab labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and you, and so you believed. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false prophets of God because we witness against God that he raised Christ from whom he did not raise if in fact the dead were not raised. For if the dead were not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. The grandfather was a bit confused when his grandson told him that for Christmas what he wanted was a transformer. He couldn't quite figure out what he was talking about until he explained it was a toy that could be changed from a robot into a tank to a truck and back to a robot again. After showing his grandfather one he already had, his grandfather was able to understand how it got its name. It also made him think about life's ultimate transformation, the one that Jesus Christ produces in the lives of all those who trust in the power of his resurrection. The story of the resurrection that we celebrate today is a story of transformations. And transformations are what is creed, key to Christianity. The power of the Christian is wrapped up in the resurrection. Paul aptly stated this, If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless. And if we have hope in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Stop and think about it. If it wasn't for the resurrection, there would be no reason for any of us to be here this morning. And you know, of all the Christian holidays we celebrate, Resurrection Sunday sits at the pinnacle of importance. And I really like the term Resurrection Sunday better than I do Easter because it better implies what it means to us. But it sits at the pinnacle of importance. Unlike Christmas, when we really don't know where it fell on the, on the calendar, uh, we do know the date of the Resurrection Day celebration because it's tied to the ancient feast of Passover. And the timing reinforces the fact that Jesus is our Passover lamb. You know, it used to be that people joked about the holiday Christians, the Christmas and Easter Christians, those that came to church only on Christmas and Easter. But under the guidance, I think, of Satan, the importance of Easter is gradually being eroded 
uh, in our minds being replaced by other things that are more important than coming to worship on Resurrection Sunday. And I wonder if Christmas will soon follow. You know, in ancient Judaism, they had a lot of feasts that they celebrated that were dictated by God that they should celebrate. And it used to be on some of those feasts, they went to Jerusalem. They made a a pilgrimage to Jerusalem uh, each year for several of those feasts. But eventually, as, as they descended into disobedience, they came to Jerusalem less and less, and it became less and less important in their lives. And I fear that that is what is happening to a lot of Christians today. Without the resurrection, Christianity is just another powerless religion. The resurrection is the only thing that sets us apart from all other religions of the world. Do you ever realize that? We are the only religion where its founder and its leader, its king, is still alive. Confucius is dead. Buddha's dead. You look at all the ancient religions. Their founders, their leaders are dead. But our leader is still alive. And that's what makes Christianity such a vital religion. And when we come face to face with Jesus, there is a power there that sets men's heart ablaze. It is a power that one day will transform the world entirely. And Jesus is our example of what a future transformation is all about. Paul stated again, he is the firstborn of them that are asleep. It's on resurrection day that we celebrate our hope for the future. And Jesus changed an example for us of what our future means. I want us to think back a little bit this morning on the resurrection transformation and think about our resurrected Jesus. What is interesting about Jesus compared to a lot of theories and ideas and stuff that run about there? Do you know Jesus still had a physical body? Tells us a lot about our future, too, I think. In Luke 24, verses 36 through 34, it says, And while they were telling these things, they were talking about the reviews and stuff of of the fact that he had been resurrected. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why did doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands. See uh, my, my feet. That it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they could still not believe it for joy, they were marveling. He said to them, have you, have you for joy, or have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before them. Jesus' invitation was not that this was a spirit that they could not understand or reach out and touch or feel or know. He had a physical being. He invited them to touch him, and he ate before them. Later on, the one man that, of the inner twelve that was not there was Thomas. And later on, when they told Thomas that Jesus had been resurrected, what did Thomas say? He said this. He said, I have some requirements before I'll believe. First, I have to see the nail prints. I have to see those scars in his hand or whatever it was, his hand was, whether it was a wrist or a hand, they argue about it. I have to put my finger into his side where the sword was thrust in. I've got to see and feel before I'm going to believe. And in John 20, 27, somebody appeared to him again. It was Jesus. And he said to Thomas, he said, reach here your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side 
but me not unbelieving, but believing. You know, these were immense changes in what they knew and understood. Yet there were changes that were important that took place in Jesus' physical being. I think it's interesting you also look at the, how he met the men on the road to Emmaus. And while it said they were watching him, he disappeared. It's quite a trick. Uh, but yet, if you remember the scripture reading, we just, or the scripture we just read from Luke 24, it says, while they were there visiting, all of a sudden he appeared in their midst. This ability wasn't the most important change, though, because we know the most important change that took place in Jesus Christ is when he was resurrected. He was resurrected to immortality. Nobody, none of us, understand what that's like. We're used to seeing people live for 70 years, if they're lucky, maybe 100 years, and then they die if they make it that far. We're used to seeing people live and die but when Jesus was resurrected, he became immortal. He could not die any longer. And that is the promise that's made for us, too. There are future transformations that the Bible tells us that's going to take place for us, just as they did for Jesus. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, it says... Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we're not all going to be in our graves when Jesus comes. But we shall all be changed. In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and those who are dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on the immortality. But when this perishable shall have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? You know, the biggest enemies that we have today is death. Because it's something that none of us can escape. Uh, it's It's our... position that we will live and now everybody must live and everybody must die unless there are those fortunate people that are still living when Jesus returns. What does it tell it's going to happen? For all of us who are raised from the grave or if we're still here and we're caught up to meet them in the air, we're going to be changed and that change is we're not going to be able to die anymore. You know We're going to be made imperishable. Most of you young people that are sitting here today don't understand this, okay, because you think you're invincible. You get to be my age, and when our bodies begin to erode, it really begins to make sense, and it's something that we long for. Uh, We get tired of all the aches and pains that come with the normal ravages of life. But one day that will be all behind us. Our bodies will not be deteriorating anymore. There will be no more aging. We're going to be imperishable. We can't die either. And that's something important. No longer subject to death. If any of you have ever stood at the casket, and a lot of us have, of loved ones, this hope takes on new meaning. The day will come when death is no more. You know, the saddest thing I ever have to do in my ministry is the time I've had to do or have done funerals of people who did not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I did one just a year or so ago. My own aunt, who was not a Christian by any means of the word. And you know what's sad about it? It's sad because I stand there and I know that she has no hope. That... She's not going to be part of God's kingdom. I'm not going to meet her again. And that's sad for me. It's much easier to stand, even though we've missed somebody, somebody that's closer to us, my own parents, watching them die and sit there knowing that one day I'm going to see them again. 
And that's what makes life, in some ways, worth while. The day will come when there is death no more. Eternal life also forecasts a total different quality of life. Paul happens or describes the day when all this will happen in 1 Thessalonians verse 4, starting with verse 16. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus will we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. It's going to be our future resurrection today. What happened today, many years ago, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, is going to be reduplicated one day in the future. One day, maybe soon. If you're alive and remain, I want you to stop and think about what that's going to be like a minute. You're walking down the street or you're busy running the football in a big important game and all of a sudden, bam, you're gone. Isn't that going to be exciting? What a thrill ride that's going to be. And what's going to be even more thrilling is knowing people that you love that have died being caught up in the air and meeting them. It's going to be one of the greatest and the biggest family reunions you will ever see. It will be the single most important day of our life and the happiest day of our life. The anticipation of this event helps us to be comforted when we face death today. On that day, everything, our joy will overflow. John presents promises of the results of that day in Revelation 21. I'm not going to look it up. But basically, he tells us that there will be no more death. There will be no more crying or pain. It's too bad Brad can't be with us today because he would appreciate that thought. No more pain, ever. There will be everything made new and fresh like it was in the Garden of Eden. In fact, Isaiah 35 describes that day this way. He says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and in the streams of the Araba. These are transformations that are going to take place based on Jesus' resurrection. You know, I think back to the man that was about my mom's age in a church in Holbrook when I was growing up, a young man, and he was deaf and dumb. And he eventually went blind, too, to make it worse. Uh, But he was one of the happiest guys I ever met. And I think one day I'm going to see Paul, and he's going to be talking. Probably you won't be able to shut him up. You couldn't shut him up when he got to talking on his hands. And it's just exciting. I think of Paul as dad. dad. He or dad had polio when he was, what, late teens, early 20s? Somewhere in there. He worked as a contractor all his life, and he walked with a limp because one leg was nothing basically but a pole, a stick that he used as a crutch. Uh, but he used to go up and down ladders, and I know he was on, in pain a lot of times. But I think what that means, we'll see the day when he will be able to leap for joy in the kingdom. Transformations that are going to take place based on Jesus' resurrection. And that's the power of Christianity. Unlike other religions who motivate their people with hatred and intolerance towards others, we are motivated by the power of a resurrected Christ. Our lives must be wrapped up in Him. But perhaps we miss some of the most important transformations that should already be taking place in our life today. And I think these are changes that we can see in the apostles. I want you to stop and think about the followers for Jesus Christ for just a minute. Uh, And we're basing most of this on Mark 16. So when I give you a verse number, that's what I'm talking about at the time, if you're looking it up in your Bibles. 
But it illustrates the pessimism that sometimes we have about the transforming power of the resurrection and skepticism somewhat towards life itself. I want you to think about the initial reaction of Mary and Mary Magdalene. It's in verse 8. It says, And they went out, and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anybody because they were afraid. When Mary and Mary Magdalene left the tomb the first time, they were afraid because they didn't know what had happened. Now, very soon they're going to be overcome and share what they had found in short, as shared in the other Gospels. But there was a certain fear in their lives in that initial reaction. When Mary Magdalene recovered and shared, it was greeted with disbelief. In verse 11 it says, And when they heard that he was alive, this is talking about the other apostles, the ones that had gathered there, and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. You ever tell somebody good news and they refuse to believe it? She had the best news of all, and she couldn't get it across to them that he was alive. And in this they had company. His followers were informed by those, or, uh, by those who Jesus had met on the road to Emmaus. And what happened? I mean, he met with them, and they went back, and they traveled that road, which was known to be a road of thieves, they traveled the dangers and went back to Jerusalem to share the news that they had seen Jesus and met and talked with him. And when they shared that news in verse 13, it says, And they went away and reported it to others, but they did not believe them either. They refused to believe a skeptical attitude. It showed a certain amount of disillusionment that had taken place. Remember what Simon Peter says? I'm going to go fishing again. Going back to my old occupation, going back to my old life. It showed his dejection. And I wonder if sometimes this happens in our own lives. We come to know the story of Jesus, maybe baptized and call ourselves Christians, but we've never really taken a hold of the power of a risen Lord. Jesus' reaction to them all comes in Mark 16, 14. It says, And afterward he appeared to the eleven themselves, as they were reclining at the table. And he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. Over and over and over again, Jesus told them, what would happen? Pride, excitement over the triumphal entry had destroyed their perspective on what was really going to happen. He had even told them he was going to Jerusalem to die, to be crucified, and they didn't believe him. You know what? If they had been the people they should have been, you know where they should have been after Jesus died? camped out at his tomb to see what was going to happen because he had told them three days and three nights and that's it I will be resurrected if they would have just believed they would have saw the most important thing most astounding thing that had ever happened on the face of this earth but they missed it because of their unbelief the power of the resurrection is shown by God transforming our lives today. And it's a good example as to what should be happening to us today. Their lives were changed when they met a resurrected Lord. They became dynamos of power. They spread the news. Those 12 common men, as we studied a while back, spread the news from the British Isles all the way to China, down into India, all into Africa, north into Russia. They spread the news across the face of this earth. Twelve common men, no different than any one of us. And they spread the news of the resurrection. Their eyes were opened. They had met a resurrected Lord. And the question we need to ask ourselves, 
Have I really read or met the resurrected Lord? Is my life a living proof of a resurrected Lord? Question is, are we transformed? You know, stories are told over and over again about what happens when Jesus' resurrection becomes a reality in our lives. Recently, I read this statement. There were days in my past life when I would have murdered a man if I was sure he had $5 in his pocket. That was written by Jerry McAuliffe, or McCauley, McAuliffe, I guess it is, who was a converted derelict who worked the slums in the slums of New York City and founded the first rescue mission in the United States. Testifying of the transforming power of the resurrected Lord. He went from being somebody that would have killed in a hat, drop of a hat to a man that was out there working trying to save the derelicts of New York City. Bruce Larson relates an incident uh, to the extent that this can sometimes be true. A college student was asked to tell about the most meaningful thing that had recently happened to him, and his answer was interesting. He said this, and he did it with a great deal of enthusiasm. He says, a few weeks ago, I had my handwriting analyzed, and I was told that I was an extrovert. I had never known that before. In fact, I was shy all my life, and I was always withdrawn and had an inferiority complex. But now that has all changed, and I've been having a great time. Because somebody had analyzed his handwriting and told him he was an extrovert. A transformation took place because of his confidence on this new description of his abilities. That's the power of the resurrection if it is active in our lives. It makes transformation even more dramatic to us. And that begins, and we've used this verse a lot, it begins with a transformation of our minds. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, it says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices acceptable to God, which is your spiritual, which is your spiritual service of worship. I wonder how many of us have ever been able to worship God in that manner. Get where our lives have been given over to Him entirely. Everything we do and say and think and give it over. The rest of that verse says, do not be conformed to this world. I liked a, a translation of that. It wasn't a translation. It was putting it into his own words. It was from a New York City gang member that wrote a book one time, a little book that was called It's Real Man. And part of this, he was putting some of the Bible into his own words. And where it says, do not be conformed to this world, it says, he translated, don't let this world squeeze you into its mold. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what... The will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The difference between Christians and the rest of this world is how we think. Do you know that the idea of being transformed in Jewish literature is always connected with resurrection? They understand that resurrection is a transforming power. Our lives are changed when we come face to face with the living Savior. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 18 says, But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord, the Spirit. 
When they came face to face with the risen Lord, the apostles' fear, their pessimism, pessimism, their skepticism, it all dissipated and went away. They became bold in their testimony of the resurrection and of the future kingdom. Paul continues that thought in the next chapter when he says this. This is first, or 2 Corinthians 4, verses uh, 16 through 18. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For the more momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. The way we think is altered by a certainty of the future. Our minds are controlled by that knowledge, and the cares and desires of this world begin to vanish. Hebrews 9 states much the same. It says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your consciousness from dead works to serving a living God? It changes the way we think. Our minds are cleansed to serve only God. We only know the power of resurrection if it has been already and is already transforming our lives. If your lives aren't being transformed, then we need to be reminded of what Jesus states. What happens if we don't believe? If we don't allow him to transform our minds? The scripture says, He who has disbelieved shall be condemned. It's that simple. Today we celebrate a great event, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But that event is only as important in our lives as the degree to which we have allowed the glory of the resurrected Lord to transform who we are. Just as this young man's life was changed by the simple act of somebody telling him that he was an extrovert, so our lives cannot help but be changed when we come face to face with the resurrected Lord.